Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our special board meeting. I'd like to open the meeting at 1.03 p.m. And let's go ahead and start with our Pledge of Allegiance. Tracy Golar, if you could lead that, please. Okay, if everyone could stand, place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I went blank. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Thank you so much, Tracy. And and that happened, so not to worry at all. <laughs> Absolutely blank. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> old age, worry. old age. <laughs> All right, uh, roll call, uh, please, for the record, show, reflect that all board members are present and Dr. Tarosian, uh, superintendent, is present. Ms. Huff, do we have any public comments for the special board meeting open session? Uh, we do, Board President Travanti. Uh, we have a, a few. I'll go ahead and read them all in their entirety because they aren't too lengthy today. Uh, the first public comment comes from... Um, uh, Liz, Liz, I apologize, I cannot pronounce your last name. It's Liz N. Liz writes, good afternoon, board members. My name is Elizabeth, and my son is a third grader in MUSD. My son loves his school and is eager to go back. I want to support my son's wishes, but still have concerns about his safety and the safety of others. Well, with the additional funding that the Monrovia Unified School District will receive from both the state and federal governments, I believe MUSD needs to spend these funds for the purpose they're meant for, for the purpose they're meant for. COVID-19 testing and plexiglass in the classrooms and other PPE is important. Now is not the time to cut corners. You should do everything possible to ensure all members of MUSD community are safe. It is equally important for parents to feel secure and confident that MUSD is doing everything in its power to keep children and employees safe. Thank you for your comments, appreciate it. And the next comment comes from Desiree O'Leary. Desiree writes, um, or she actually has three questions. Uh, will I be able to choose which hybrid group my child is placed in? I need, I need it to work with my own work schedule. Question two, will there be an option for early drop-off similar to early morning village if we are um, paying for the pod option? Question three, will students in the pod have to be picked up by 2.30 p.m.? Thank you very much, Ms. O'Leary, for your questions. <clears throat> uh, the next comment comes from Gabriel Esparza. Gabriel writes, as a parent of Brad Oaks Elementary School, as a parent of a Brad Oaks Elementary School student, I prefer the schools to continue 100% virtual learning. This, in my opinion, will be the least disruptive to the students learning for the remainder of the school year. For those students and parents who prefer in-person learning, additional learning pods should be made available with those teachers dedicated to 100% in-person teaching. Teachers will be spread extremely thin, having to balance their students from both virtual and in-person learning, which could be detrimental to both sets of students. I am hopeful the board will take these issues into strong consideration and not feel pressure from outside entities to abruptly open schools. Thank you, Gabriel Esparza. Thank you, Mr. Esparza. Uh, the next public comment comes from Shannon Johnson. Shannon writes, uh, dear board members, I am concerned about how the money that the district receives from the state will be spent. What types of separate school supplies will, will, will each student need besides our regular crayons, pencils, etc.? What will it pay for? The learning pods and the photos in the presentation showed individual baskets for students' personal items. Will the money go for purchasing these? Respectfully, Shannon Johnson. Thank you very much for your comments, Ms. Johnson. <clears throat> uh, the next comment comes from Amanda Lynn. Amanda, Amanda writes, hi, thank you for the revised hybrid model. She lists some questions here. Her questions are, what's the distance learning schedule like? 
Will the distance learning be on Zoom with the teacher? Will there be interaction during distance learning? Is the learning pod only available in the afternoon? How about prior to 8.30 a.m.? How are the cohorts being selected? What is the schedule like for, dual immer for the dual immersion program? Schedule-wise, I prefer the original hybrid model. This is the least disruptive to my child's current schedule. With two months left in the school year, I prefer to have the least changes as we have already made arrangements in line. Thank you so much for all of your efforts, Amanda. Thank you very much, Ms. Lynn. Appreciate it. Uh, the next public comment comes from Eddie and Destiny. I'll just say last name R, initial R. Um, Eddie and Destiny Wright. Good evening, board members. First, I wanted to thank the task force again for working tirelessly on trying to get our children back in school. I want to make this short and form my questions in bullet, bullet point form as I observed how that would help during potential reading of this public comment. Uh, the first bullet point is, why is it that we're moving forward with implementing a two, a two, one and a half days a week if it was already established that four out of five board members did not agree with the schedule? His second bullet point reads, is there an opportunity for parents to pick which co cohort their child will belong to as planning for care is important? And his last bullet point reads, since it seems the task force in intent is to keep children at school for half a day, is it going to be a guarantee that there will be learning pods for children to stay until whatever the end of the school day is for their appropriate grade level? Okay, thank you very much, Eddie and Destiny. Mm -hmm. uh, the next public comment comes from Angelica Flores. Angelica writes, what about staff if their children are doing full-time distance learning and there's no child care available? How will that work out or what can we do? Shoshana, say that again, would you please? Sorry, that comment comes from Angelica Flores. And Angelica writes, what about staff if their children are doing full-time distance learning and there is no child care available? How will that work out or what can we do? Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Flores. Uh, the next public comment comes from Andrea Bailey. Uh, Andrea writes, Dear Monrovia Board of Education, my name is Andrea Bailey Cross, and I'm the mother of a first grader at Monroe Elementary School. I have been truly amazed and grateful to the teachers who have adapted so quickly to an entirely new, mo new mode of teaching for which they have very little training. If you've ever been in a first grade classroom, you would know the immense amounts immense amount of patience and preparation it takes to keep things running smoothly. And in observing this in distance learning, it is all the more complicated in Zoom. While I appreciate the board's interest in having students return to school as quickly as possible within the given boundaries, I have grave concerns for the lack of preparation and training time that teachers have been given to prepare for the proposed high flex model. It seems that this model is not added in school and skills for teachers, but instead requires exponential learning. Asking teachers to manage a room of children while also trying to manage and provide quality education with students Zooming, particularly young children, and especially those who, like my son, already have difficulty sitting still and paying attention, seems to be an entirely new skill. It is not simply shifting skills from one domain to another. This is a brand new way of doing classroom management. Moreover, as a parent who is working remotely while also managing distance learning, this seems to put an increased pressure on parents of the youngest learners who have the hardest time attending in Zoom learning. Even with the teacher's attention entire, entirely focused on the distance space, on the days when the rumors become Zoomers, I have deep concerns about the quality of education for those who are at home, concerns not born of my confidence in the teachers, but rather the impossible situation in which they are placed in this model. 
Thank you for your time to read these comments and for the impossible task you're trying to accomplish for our children and our community. My hope is that the teachers whose who's pay and often more than not unpaid time and energy is respected and honored in this process. They have been asked more than what they are paid to do and they do it because of the love of our kids. I would hope that in this season of loss and pain, we would prioritize the health and mental health of our fantastic teachers. Thank you, Ms. Cross, for your comments. And the next public comment comes from Marcus Crunk. Uh, Marcus writes, thanks for amending the original plan. Two thoughts. One, if numbers justify it, why not have one teacher per grade continue the Zoomer classes from their home or classroom, allowing the in-person classes to focus on kids in attendance? The split, focus, the split focus seems like quite a balancing act for teachers. Having to switch teachers to stay at home doesn't seem like a big, big enough reason not to do it for the greater good. It's only three months. Is there a way to decide who and why to limit any potentially jeal jealousy amongst teachers. Question two, why does lunch have to be at 1130? Why not noon? I'm sure each day will have time eaten away by the intricacies involved. Kids get more teacher time with another short break added to help them focus. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, the next public comment comes from Janet Fuller. Janet writes, good evening to all. I'm a parent of a TK student at Plymouth. As a parent of a five-year-old student that will hope, hopefully be in a class environment for the first time, what will be the protocols for the younger kids? As we know in the past, rug time and playing time, et cetera, I have heard they are to sit in a desk and not really move or socialize with classmates. I find it very hard to have five to six year olds sit in one place for a couple of hours and much more or less keep a mask on for that long. Thank you for your time, Janet Fuller. Thank you, Ms. Fuller, appreciate it. Uh, the next public comment comes from Reagan Henry. Reagan writes, this is ridiculous, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. If you're going to be open even one hour, why? why would you not be open the, the whole day? Putting kids in school for a few hours and asking parents to pick them up and take them home to continue their school day at home in the middle of the day makes no sense. With a few hours left in the day, what is the point of finishing the day off on school grounds? I'm sorry, finishing the day off of school grounds. What about working parents? You're creating pods for kids to stay on campus, but not in their classroom. How does any of this make sense? This is your alternative to helping working parents, creating another program to stay on school grounds, but not in their class. You are, you are completely abusing and taking advantage of this pandemic. Thank you, Ms. Henry, appreciate your comments. Uh, the next public comment comes from Susanna Ravellis. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Susanna writes, Dear board members, as a parent of a student in the kindergarten dual immersion program at Plymouth, I respectfully request that you allow Plymouth's DI program flexibility in, in designing their hybrid model. Plymouth's DI program is unique to any, excuse me, Plymouth's DI program is unique to any other program in our district. It is a 50-50 model. The current hybrid model will limit the students' interaction with their teachers at an age when listening and speaking are the main vehicles of learning. Please consider allowing flexibility in the Chinese DI program when approving a hybrid model. Thank you for your time, Ms. Susanna Rebellis. Thank you, Ms. Rebellis. And I'm just checking to make sure I haven't missed any. <clears throat> and those are all of the public comments for today. Thank you, Ms. Huff, for reading those. And thank you all uh, to all who submitted the public comments for our special board meeting. Uh, Ms. Huff, please forward those comments to the board members. Of thank you. 
Hey, on and, to and, uh, uh, yes. President Travanti, will you please direct staff to provide answers? Yes, absolutely. Um, Dr. Terosian, if you can ensure that everyone receives a response. Thank you. And that'll close uh, the public comment section of the open session agenda. And we'll move on to our uh, one action item for this agenda, approval of the hybrid instructional model for the reopening of MUSD elementary schools. And I will turn it over to Dr. Terosian. Thank you, President Trevanti, members of the board. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I believe that the next slide has uh, the proposed schedule as presented on Wednesday, March 10th, during the regular board meeting of the Board of Education. Uh, the schedule uh, takes those students who are interested in in-person or who would be participating in the in-person uh, instruction uh, for each class and uh, divides them into two separate cohorts one cohort uh, Mondays and Tuesdays, and the other cohort Thursdays and Fridays. Uh, and the schedule, student arrival would be between 8 and 8.30. Uh, instruction begins at 8.30, and breaks would be uh, determined by each campus to best meet their needs. We want to ensure full flexibility. Uh, we have uh, grab and go lunches, and then, uh, continuing with some synchronous instruction from one to two, uh, whether you're in a learning pod because of uh, childcare issues or from home. On Wednesdays, we have uh, full distance, excuse me, remote instruction only from 8.30 uh, to 11.30. And um, after lunch, 12.30 to two would be asynchronous. Uh, this revised model uh, is really because of the input we received following the webinar. Uh, what we heard from uh, many parents was that dropping off students uh, in the middle of the day and picking them up uh, for a two hour period was simply not viable, especially for working parents with less flexible schedules. Uh, for that reason, we we used that model, flipped it, and developed uh, uh, an add in an hour uh, in order to allow parents to drop off on their way to work and, if possible, to pick children up on their way uh, during their lunch break, if that were possible. Uh, for those who require continued child care, we will be establishing additional learning pods. And I am so thankful to our part-time staff members who've already indicated their willingness to work extra hours in order to assist us with the additional supervisory needs will be, that will be required on each of our campuses. So participation in these hybrid learning pods is entirely voluntary. Uh, there is, um, of course, a capacity that we have and uh, should uh, the registration and interest exceed our capacity, we will move to a priority order. And uh, while this is, uh, the learning pods are for daycare or childcare purposes, and there's a cost associated with uh, participating. Uh, additional information, registration information will be sent home to every parent uh, so that they can have um, a chance to review the many, many options from full day to partial day to full week. And uh, again, the instruction during the school day, there is no cost for that. That is our uh, free and public education. Uh, it's simply for daycare and supervision. Um, we want to make sure that we um, support families to the best of our ability. Uh, the, that was the main concern we heard from parents in addition to some concerns about instruction, which were really uh, echoed, uh, echoed the concerns of teachers. Teachers also, as well as many parents, uh, were concerned about keeping that warm, engaging classroom community that they so worked so hard to establish since the beginning of the school year. Uh, the, the second real concern was, and this probably is the most critical uh, to our mission, and it's about the delivery of quality instruction to every student. Uh, 
dual immersion becomes especially tricky. So uh, in November, we ordered uh, almost $750,000 worth of technology for our teachers. Uh, computers, tablets, speakers, microphones, document cameras. Uh, we, we purchased in order to make sure that the tools were uh, available in classrooms should we have the opportunity to open our classes. Um, we received those uh, purchases and I've been setting those up. Those need to be distributed to, to teachers and we need to also uh, help teachers set up these new tools in every classroom because it, that's a lot of new technology. And to, to make sure that the placement is the very best and uh, that we're checking uh, the capacity of every system, uh, we're, we're doing those tests now. And we will be helping and training teachers to pull that together. And one of the public comments that we received uh, Wednesday evening was why, uh, why not mount the projectors that we already have in every classroom onto the ceiling. And, and that really is um, something that would be wonderful to do. Uh, the cost per classroom is between eight and $10,000. It becomes cost prohibitive and it would be uh, an aspirational goal of ours to do that for our schools at some point. Um, we also understand that the challenge of teaching students who are in school as well as students at home. We, we heard the interest of not relying on live streaming instruction. And for that reason, the HyFlex model was included as an alternative to live streaming. Uh, this research-based model uses the concept of student centers to target lesson de delivery to various student groups. Of course, another alternative uh, method is uh, developing asynchronous lessons. Districts uh, and teachers across the straight state are using one or a combination of all of these uh, lesson delivery models. And we intend to use their experience, their expertise in order to help train our teachers. Uh, if, if they can do it in Lowell Joint and Pleasanton and Westminster and Tustin, we can do it in Monrovia. Uh, there are many, many, what, what I heard today uh, were many questions that we look forward to solving together. There are lots of details and, and we need to be able uh, to have an opportunity to solve those and do some problem solving. It's difficult to problem solve without actually having the model in place and without actually knowing who's going to be participating. So there are lots of possibilities and hypothetical questions. And um, once a model is established, we really will be able to get down to the business of figuring out each of those details together. Uh, in, in developing this model, I want to make sure to thank every elementary principal and task force member. They extended the task force meeting that they had um, last Thursday on March 4th, they had a task force meeting. And that meeting uh, really went into breakout rooms that extended at schools, by school, through the weekend and through this week. Uh, school teams, uh, teachers, parents, classified employees have continued to work and provide input. And we wanna make sure that the model that we have at each school while uh, following a, a, a consistent structure and this umbrella that, that schools have the flexibility to work within that model to better meet the needs of their community um, and their instructional needs. So that input from, from schools is reflected in what you see today and what was presented on Wednesday. Uh, in terms of a timeline, uh, we would like to begin by the last week of March. Uh, Assembly Bill 86 uh, incentivizes a timeline, which according to our current staff status is both achievable and uh, viable safely. The bill states that from April 1st to May 15th inclusive, 
a district's apportionment of funds shall be reduced by 1% for each day of instruction provided for in the school calendar that the district does not provide in-person instruction as identified by the school calendar. So I, on Wednesday, our Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, Connie Wu presented the budget and we are going to be able to certify a positive budget. Uh, but many of us still felt the trauma of having a $15 million gap during the summer and working, t working really uh, weeks, cutting, addressing, revising, moving, and best using whatever funds we could in order to bring that shortfall down to something a little more manageable. And thankfully with more, um, with more one-time money, we are now at a positive certification and uh, the fiscally responsible thing to do is to make sure not to leave any money on the table because while I may not be here, there's not a single employee within this district to whom I would want anybody to give a layoff notice because we can't make that budget. And so uh, if we have to work harder to figure out some of those details, uh, none of the administrators at, on this, uh, in this district are, are unwilling to work harder and longer in order to make things better for our students, our staff members, and our district as a whole. Uh, this is an achievable timeline in order to work safely. Thank you, Dr. Tarosian. Is that the end of your report? And that concludes my report. My recommendation is that we, uh, that the Board of Education is requested to approve this model of hybrid instruction so that uh, we can move forward in our uh, problem solving and uh, planning in order to open safely. And just for clarification, this is for the elementary school only. This is for the elementary schools only at this time. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Tarosian, for your report. I will open it up to board members for questions. Usually I can see all of your faces, but oh, here we go. I slid it over. All right, um, if you can raise your hand, I might've missed a hand. All right. Jennifer? Thank you, and Dr. Trosian, thank you for such a thoughtful and comprehensive report. I appreciate the the, the recap and, and the um, attention to all of the detail. Um, mine is a very small question, um, just and it's on this slide, uh, just to, to, to understand, uh, if we look at, at the second to last line, it says 11.30 to 2.30, lunch learning pods. And then the following line is 1 p.m. to 2 p.m., synchronous instruction, high flex model. So the way I'm interpreting this is that the synchronous instruction, if you're in a learning pod, will com be completed at 2 p.m. And then they have until 2.30. That 2 that 30 minute period is the window of, of um, collecting one's effects and checking out for the day. Is that correct? Right again, for okay. Anderson. Okay, thank you very much. That was the only part that I wasn't quite clear about. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Trozin? You know, I can't see everybody for some reason. Board member Lockerbie has a question. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Go ahead, Celine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thorosian. Um, I have several questions. There are some that I'm going, um, not going to ask right now because as you had mentioned in your presentation, there are some things that you still have to work through. You have to implement this. Some things are site specific and will be addressed with by, by principals. Um, so I, I wanna reiterate that <laughs> and, and, and let the public know that some of your questions will be answered later. Um, these are the questions that I have. 
Um, I know that there are concerns about teacher vaccinations. Will any of the teachers have been vaccinated by the time we open? What are we looking at for that? Board Vice President Lockerbie, I believe, um, and Dr. Jackson, please correct me if I'm wrong. I know you're here. Uh, during our presentation on Wednesday, Dr. Jackson reported that of uh, the, the staff members who responded to um, both surveys, 100% uh, of respondents would have had the opportunity to be vaccinated. Um, really, they, they would have received their first dose by this weekend. Uh, Dr. Jackson, I see you've unmuted and I appreciate your uh, verification. Yes, I can verify that. 100% of those who indicated an interest in the vaccination will have received a vaccination uh, by this Saturday. By this Saturday. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, you you did touch upon this, Dr. Throsi, and I just want to clarify things. Um, the, the first line of this schedule says 8 to 8.30 student arrival. You'd mentioned that official start time is 8.30, but in um, last Wednesday's meeting, you did mention that the the... the return to the campus every day will be a staggered and um, a different procedure. So if I'm a parent, what time do I need to have my child on campus? Board member Lockerbie, I am going to, to suggest that that would best be answered by each principal because what we have also established on every campus are additional um, drop off and pick up points for our students so that there's not a congregation in any one place. That makes sense, thank you. Uh, my next question is, are there going to be paraprofessionals during the high flex in-person model? Uh, and this is one that I think both Dr. Jackson and Dr. Kaiser may be assisting me with. We have requested and asked um, our uh, part-time staff if they are available for additional uh, hourly. Our primary uh, or our priorities will begin with supervision on campus first. Um, the adding of hybrid learning pods second. And so um, there may be that opportunity to assist in the classrooms as well. So it really depends upon our capacity and uh, we are going to, I, I know that Dr. Jackson has already uh, surveyed part-time staff to find out who is available and we will uh, need to look through that um, list and make the assignments. Thank you. Um, in one of your slides from the 10th, it mentioned, uh, one of the slides said in the schedule, classroom preparation, parentheses, one hour distance learning. What exactly does that mean? I will begin. I, I'll ask uh, Dr. Kaiser, our uh, leader of that task force, to assist with this one. But our students will be provided with uh, daily interaction with their teacher. But in the mornings, uh, the teacher will frame the day, welcome students. This is that community time for our uh, for every classroom, and th those two days will be primarily asynchronous instruction with the exception of that hour which frames each day. Uh, this gives uh, classroom teachers a chance to set up their classrooms, to uh, get some assistance with uh, how the equipment works. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to provide the training about how to use the high flex model and uh, really just get uh, some better 
knowledge of how things will be operating. So one is for teacher training, and the other is to make sure that students maintain that sense of continuity. Thank you. Um, my next question, you did touch upon um, some today, and also that sort of ties into your just last response, and it's about having IT staff to help with teacher setup. So you did mention today, we are going to have staff help with teacher setup with the new technology and the new flex model. And we are working through the details of that now to try and make sure that there are people on every campus able to assist in addition you know, when we say technology department, let's be clear, it's a very limited staff. And, and um, we need, and administrators are not experts in this arena either. So we will be doing this trainer of trainers model so that there are people on every campus who are able to assist. And when there are some real uh, problems that require the expertise of the members of the, our technology department, they can come in and assist. Thank you. Um, I asked this question on Wednesday. I'm going to ask it again, and maybe you'll have a, yet a better idea. Maybe we won't until things are uh, implemented. But I wanted to know if you have yet an estimate of what the in-person cohort sizes will be. I know they'll differ and vary between um, sites and classes, but do you have an estimate yet? So what, I can give you an average. Let's, uh, you ask for an estimate, here's an estimate. You know, uh, let's say that the classroom has 30 students in it, okay? Um, most TK to um, three will have about 24 or 25, but, uh, and fourth and fifth will have 35, probably, 32 to 35. But in a class of 30 students, uh, the average response rate we received was that 60% of parents were interested in hybrid learning and having their children participate in person to the extent possible, with 40% staying home. If 60% of students um, were interested, 60% of 30 would be 18 students. Those 18 students would be divided into two making nine students per cohort. So nine students on Monday and Tuesday, nine students on Thursday and Friday. But again, this is just, as you said, it's an average. Uh, one of the uh, individuals in public comment said, could this be a viable possibility? There are lots and lots of possibilities. What we'd like to do is uh, have the model in place, ask uh, parents to commit to one model or another, or remain with uh, independent uh, study at Mountain Park. Uh, but once we have those numbers in place, we'll be able to uh, develop um, and, and establish the classes and look for those unique opportunities to maximize the instruction. Well, thank you. Uh, my last question is a comment. <laughs> and, um, one of the words that you used today in your presentation was together. And you said, we are working on this whole process together. And I wanted to just put emphasis on that, on that and um, tell you how much I appreciate that stance that you are taking and that you are making sure that you are working and having your cabinet and your staff work together with administrators, with teachers, with family, and with the board. I appreciate that you understand that and that you are implementing that. And um, I will continue to be watching for that. And I am in great appreciation of, uh, uh, of that standpoint of yours. So thank you. That ends my, <clears throat> my, my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lockerbie. And I'll check off a few of my questions Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Goller. Thank you, uh, Board President. Um, 
I have a few questions and thank you, um, board member Lockerbie for being very thorough in, in the questions that, like we said, we can check off the ones we don't have to ask now. <laughs> so thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Therosian, I, I, I'm, 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 I want to check my sense and understanding of what the board is being asked to approve uh, as per your recommendation. And as such, the model that is being presented, are you offering this as a framework for which decisions can be made about how it plays out in the details of it that are site specific. So my question is that this structure as a framework allows for sites to craft the details to meet the needs of their site. Is that a correct understanding? Yes, there is, there is some flexibility. So let me begin with, I am asking the board to, and I am recommending this hybrid model of instruction to be initiated at each of our elementary schools uh, for the remainder of the school year. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, this model has within it, uh, in fact, I think uh, you see between um, 9 and 1130, it says breaks to be decided by each site. Uh, that should be indicative of the intent. The intent is, while this is the framework, this is the umbrella, uh, we are a unified district, not uh, a district where one school does one thing and another does another, but using this as that umbrella, allowing for some flexibility within it. So it's this loose, tight structure. It's tight as the umbrella, but loose within the pieces. Okay, okay, thank you. And, and then, um, next question, are there provisions um, being planned for process monitoring? In other words, continuous support afforded to the staff that will then implement the details as they determine best meets their site needs, such as if future technology equipment is discovered, we still need it. Greater planning time, prep time allocated. Uh, Lockerbie talked about uh, paraprofessionals, teacher assistants, aides in the classroom. Will we have a provision for process monitoring as we go to sure up the means of support that will be needed to have this be as successful as possible. One of the things that makes this district work is the communication um, at the school level, the school level to the district level. So I won't be discussing specifics on any campus necessarily, but the principals will. They'll mm -hmm. communicate, we'll communicate with them. And so it's this accordion structure. It's the manner with which, by which uh, the model was primarily finalized uh, with the task force. The task force began as a, a large group and actually uh, had members added to it so that by the end there was a teacher, a parent, uh, a classified member and an administrator from each school minimally as part of that task force. And they uh, went into their breakout rooms to discuss how it would work on their site using their unique context and then coming back uh, so that there's input and feedback in that accordion. The process monitoring for this would be no different than we do for really anything else, what we did for distance learning or for um, the planning. And that is allow for school-based discussions and brainstorming we are establishing something new. It will be imperfect. Uh, we will continue to refine to make sure that we are doing the very best we can, uh, given 
our experience and our context, but we know that these are new habits that we're also establishing, and that too takes time. So one of the things that we'll be doing during spring break, and that was part of the timeline that uh, was presented on Wednesday during the regular board meeting, is to make adjustments as necessary. We'll have a few days, we'll have a sense of things, and we'll have a, an idea of what we can move around in order to refine and better support our students, our teachers, and our administrators. Excellent. Last piece. So that's very, very positive in terms of that being built into the ingredients of build it as we go, right? Um, will we have some type of formal process in June at the, at the, at the back end to evaluate identifying what worked and what changes are needed as we look forward to August possibly having to do something similar? Yes, that is uh, as part of our build it as you go uh, year, that is uh, not only a good thing, a good practice. You know, when we began with distance learning, we we actually had uh, two rounds of feedback with parents soliciting their feedback regarding the rigor, the time in class, the 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 work, and uh, that information was shared with schools so that they could make whatever adjustments locally, and uh, help inform our processes at the district level. That kind of uh, you know with two months left in the school year. Uh, I'm not sure we'll have two rounds under us. And, um, but I, uh, having some, an opportunity for feedback towards the end of the year would not only inform how we can improve, uh, but even if we are allowed to come to school in, in the traditional model, with everybody back at the same time. Are there practices that we might want to maintain in the future as part of uh, this opportunity to innovate and better serve students? There are things that we have learned uh, work better with this Zoom model. Uh, and while uh, I, I saw two of our administrators today uh, and I was so excited to see them in person. I see them on Zoom on a regular basis, but it was delightful to see them in person. I, we're looking forward to that, but there are still some uh, parts of this new uh, dynamic and these new platforms that we think may be able to extend into the future. So uh, the feedback would be not only for how did the instruction work, but, you know, did this work better for IEPs or parent-teacher conferences or, you know, what worked and what didn't and what can we maintain? What can we not try again? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that opportunity to ask those questions. Thank you, Tracy. Good questions. Appreciate that. Any other comments or questions? Mr. Hammond? I'd like to build off of something that Tracy said. Um, and Tracy, thank you for your first question. That, that was my that was my number one. Um, if this passes today, um, how soon are we prepared to start giving training to our classroom teachers? We need some time. Right now, we're we're setting up and testing the equipment. <laughs> we need a little bit of time to get caught up with that as well. So I, I am, I'm prepared to this question right now. I know that that is what we are working on and educational services is working on that. Could you give me uh, some kind of indicator of, of time? Uh, within the next couple of weeks. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and this is going to be a very tough question. Um, the key to how this works will be the district office supports for the site. Mm-hmm. Um, are we prepared to support the different school sites? I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. We're, we are like when we first started uh, distant learning back last March, doing a paradigm shift in education. And there's by judging from the amount of questions that we have received over the last few couple of weeks and including today, there is much confusion that's out there. Mm-hmm. Um, since we're the purveyor of the communication, are we prepared to be able to communicate what it is that we're doing and support the school sites? It's gonna to have to come from the district office, which means um, you, Sue, Darwin, are gonna be super busy making sure people get the right information. Are we prepared to do that? Uh, That's exactly what we have been doing. I mean, since the webinar, if I say that we have responded to hundreds of questions individually, I'm being pretty accurate. And, uh, you know, the request about responding to public comments, when there is a response, when there is a question posed, we have responded. And, uh, you know, Ms. Huff has read dozens of public comments over the last uh, few meetings. And we are uh, working as quickly as we can to respond to those. Uh, We have lots of questions to answer. And what we'd like to do is make sure that we continue to find those questions and resolve them either broadly or allow principals and work with principals to resolve them locally. Prior to this meeting, I got off the phone with one of our secondary principals who was working through a list of questions. And we just went through each question. And as we were doing that on that Google doc that had been shared, I noticed Dr. Jackson adding his responses to the same document. So we, and, and you know, those, that was a document that had been shared less than an hour ago. And the part of the my reason for asking that question is so that you could articulate the steps that you go through daily to make sure that the information is getting back to those who request the information. Um, the district office is here to support the school site, not the other way around. They're not here to support us. We're here to support them. And I want to make sure, and you have articulated, that the lines of communications are wide open, both receiving and outgoing. Um, <clears throat> I, I, there's another part to this. I've asked this to board president Travanti. Um, shortly, there will be a motion on this item. I would like to add <clears throat> to that motion that there will be weekly updates that will be posted to our website and social media so that not only the board and the school sites are aware of what's happening, is that those in the community who are interested in how we're progressing will be able to watch it, not in real time, but as close as possible to getting fresh information. Okay. I will add that. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Are you are you good? I'm good. Okay. Um, we, I want to elaborate on the teacher prep time, and I'm not talking about the lesson time before class um, or during that week, but I'm talking about the plan for preparing the classroom um, for going back to school. So I understand that there is a plan for that. And if you could elaborate and explain how teachers or what time teachers are going to have to prepare their actual classroom, not just the technology piece. Obviously they need to play around with their technology once it's set up. I mean, you just don't log into a a new laptop with, uh, I'm not a techie person, so it takes me a little bit. Um, How that's gonna work out and how how they will have time to actually, our teachers are awesome. They, They design their classroom and they make it colorful and attractive and 
there's a lot of learning that happens even on the boards, not just by what the teacher is articulating. So please, if you could elaborate on that. I, right, right now what we have is, um, the next step is for us to distribute the technology to the teachers so that they can take it and take it to their classrooms to set it up. Okay. Uh, we'd like to uh, allocate two days to teachers to set up their classrooms. Uh, and that means not just the, the technical aspect of it, but as you said, the engaging warm environment within the classroom uh, and provide them with uh, also some steps about how to use the technology, whether it's in the high flex model and training in that, or how to, uh, they, are, they, they are already creating asynchronous lessons but also uh, how to, if they wanted to live stream, how to allow for that. You know, the pictures that were presented, um, that were included within the presentation on Wednesday indicated differences in classrooms. Those were all from the same district, but some had, um, some had baskets uh, next to the students, some did not. Some had uh, pencil cases, some did not. Some had uh, a screen in the front of the room. Some were using the whiteboard. So there's going to be some differences everywhere. And we'll come up with what works best. Teachers will identify what works best for them and as schools will identify. But they really need the time to um, think about it and collaborate about it. Thank you, Dr. Trozian. Um, it, if this plan is approved, then the next step for a site principal is to schedule a meeting with parents to go over their site-specific plan um, so they understand how the arrival is going to work out and that staggered arrival. Um, you know, just go over the safety protocols again, the mask wearing and, you know, the restroom protocols. Um, and then, of course, the dismissal time those that are choosing to stay on campus through the hybrid learning pod and those that are being picked up. So all that will be given out by the site principal, right? Yes, and there are things that um, we know already will be consistent district-wide. We're developing our cleaning protocols now. Uh, and uh, Dr. Jackson has met with the team uh, about how that will work and what those high touch surfaces are and what will be needed between cohorts. Uh, we have a health screening. This is a habit we need uh, to remind people to, to complete their, uh, their health survey before entering. Teachers will have access to who's completed it and who is not within their classroom. Uh, and again, these are habits to get into as they move forward. So uh, we have some health and safety protocols and um, some additional resources in every classroom to assist with those health and safety pieces. Thank you, Dr. Rosian. My last um, question or point is, since we um, have been receiving quite a few questions and comments about the um, funding that we have received, um, the CARES Act funding specifically had um, some requirements, very strict requirements on how that money could be spent. And it also all had to be spent by a certain date. I believe that was in December sometime um, and allocated and spent and so forth. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I know you mentioned $750,000 in uh, technology. Can you talk a little bit more about that and the requirements that they put on that money? Certainly. Uh, the money was um, the money that we received was um, helped to, with the reassignment of our personnel. The establishment of our learning pods really couldn't have happened without that support. Uh, the so it's learning loss mitigation. It was facility, um, and it was technology, and of course human resources. So those big buckets. We had, uh, we invested in additional curriculum, uh, updating our curriculum and 
making sure that we had online resources in those areas that had been um, so out of date. Uh, the money I think was allocated in July and had to be expended by December 31st. And by expended doesn't mean, you know, we're gonna pay for it when it comes and it's okay if it comes in April. The guidelines were you pay for it, it has to arrive before December 31st or you can't spend your money on that. And so we were thinking, do we need to buy additional student Chromebooks? No, we should not because those are on back order. We can't buy those. Uh, and so they wouldn't arrive before that 31st deadline. So there were a lot of discussions that we had. Um, it was presented to the board a couple of times. It was presented to our district advisory committee, our district English language advisory committee and our council PTA uh, when uh, board member Anderson was president there. I presented it to the council PTA. So uh, we, we talked about what the items were, what we were going to be doing and uh, the, the section about learning loss mitigation and how those funds were expended is actually on our website. Should anybody want to, to go to the um, learning and continuity plan link that's on our uh, website, they can do so and just read through the document itself. Thank you very much. So basically you had to use it or lose it, which is kind of typical of government <laughs> and the funding that they provide. Um, there are There is additional funding coming in the future, but we have not received um, $1 from it yet at this point. Can you confirm that? I, I can confirm that. I can also, I do want to share though that once our plan had been approved and the materials purchased and um, with confirmation and we kept receipts saying we will be receiving these by the 31st because we knew we were going to be audited. Uh, I think in late December, uh, they provided some flexibility so that December 31st was not that deadline. But by then, every dollar had been accounted for and we were not, I, I'm sure it was for those districts who couldn't meet that deadline. I'm sure there were some, we weren't going to be one of them. I do not like leaving money that is intended for our students on any table other than one in the program. Thank you. Thank and, you for explaining that. And um, <laughs> the the new money, had, there is some flexibility there and we we will need to do a presentation on that so that everybody is clear. But uh, that too is fairly new and we, we need to study it ourselves. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Very much. Um, with that, then I don't see any, any other hands. Uh, Tracy then, had a question. I'm, I'm sorry, Tracy. Did, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was going to let it go. Thank you, Rob. Um, we, we keep asking about the provision for teacher planning and preparing for this shift in the way we are accustomed to doing um, teaching and learning. Our rumors and Zoomers happening simultaneously. Um, is the question would be, I think we have a pupil free day coming up. Is it March 19th? Is, is there, are there plans in place to kind of leverage that to support what is needed? You know, we hadn't talked about that. Um, we're uh, uncomfortable, but uh, there may be an opportunity yet. We've been so focused on this. <laughs> and there's been so many, many questions I haven't had. Um, none of us have had much time to do anything other than respond to the many, many questions and concerns about this model for the last two weeks. Um, Fair enough. That, that March 19th day uh, had originally been leveraged uh, as a, because it had been a pupil free day, uh, we offered our staff an opportunity to swap that day with a day before school began in order to get oh. an ADA of learning um, and, and training because distance learning, if you recall, distance learning was 
brand new. Nobody knew how to do it. There was a lot of discomfort and concern about how we were going to actually do this. And I am, I mean, one of the, the, the best parts of these conversations is the fact that people want to stay in distance learning because the instruction is so robust. Now, back in March and April, that was not what we were hearing. <laughs> so uh, we had swapped the day out. Uh, and, and really the conversation we had before the, the, the firestorm of comments and questions, uh, the, the dilemma we had was, do we offer this as a day? But how about those people who've already uh, planned a non-work day for, with family, they, you know, they they should have that, and we should honor that commitment. Um, so again, it's um, a conversation we can probably pursue um, soon. Thank you. Yeah, I I was not completely aware of the swap and the provision. So if it's a pupil free day and possibly a staff free day. There are many who probably need a lot of rest. So <laughs> I get it. I get it. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Any other questions? Well, then I will move um, or ask for a motion. Um, I need to hear the language that uh, Mr. Hammond wanted to add to this. One we more time. Up. Uh, I'll read it again. Weekly, week to add to the motion that there will be weekly updates to the board or more than weekly if the information is deemed uh, important and progress will be on our website and through social media so that the community and those who are interested are able to watch the progress of this. Can I, am I able to ask for clarification on your, your meaning uh, of your motion? Absolutely. What do you mean by um, uh, um, sharing progress? Does that mean they, putting they, up our, our meeting um, YouTube? No. What I mean by the progress is as the steps get implemented to doing this, like uh, I'm going to use this as an example, as um, I'm going to pick, I'm going to use Monroe as the example. Uh, multiple pickup spots. There will be pickup spots on Olive. There will be pickup spots on Alta Vista. There will be pickup and drop-off spots on Colorado. Um, let's say that we're going to split the alphabet into three parts so that A through H go to one place, blah, 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 blah. That won't just be designated to the school. It will be designated to our website as well in case the person who was intended to hear it didn't hear it there's another place that they can go to to see all that information as it's progressing. Okay, so when you say district website, does that also include site website? I, 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 would, oh. I would suggest that the way that the most, that I would suggest that putting the information out in as many places as possible, as long as it's clear and concise, is better and it'll eliminate the 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 concerns that people have because they don't they don't know. The more places that people can get the information, the easier it will be for people to understand what's happening. Um, I, 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 think we, I, I think we try to do a good job. I just want it to be part of the motion so that it, it gets adhered to. Can you read the whole, can you, Mr. Hammond, read it so that we get it all um, as you sure. crafted it? I'll be happy to make a motion. I'll move to approve the hybrid instructional model for the reopening of MUSD elementary schools and include that we have weekly updates to the board on progress and post that progress to our websites and social media. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, we have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Ms. Huff, can you call roll, please? Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Golar? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board President Trevanti? Yes. Motion carries 5-0.
Thank you very much, Ms. Huff, and thank you. Um, I'll extend my thank yous again to Dr. Tarosi and the task force and uh, Dr. Kaiser and Dr. Jackson. I do have a closing statement I'd like to read. Uh, Mr. Trevanti, one thing. Yes, oh, I'm sorry, that. Mr. Herman. It's okay. I wanted to say this before the vote, and I didn't think it was correct. I wanted to do it now. The uh, board member Golar brought up a great point and, uh, about the People Free Day, and probably people needed a break. I don't know if people understand how many days Dr. Tarosian's been leading this district without a break. Um, it is... I think it's really important for people to understand. The board directed Dr. Tarosian to take a weekend off. It happened to be the same weekend at the Bobcat fire. That was the first chance that he had for a day off since we closed the schools on March the 13th. She worked every day during the summer and it was tireless. I can speak on uh, personal experience that we were having conversations on the weekends, every weekend, sometimes late into the evenings uh, on that weekend, um, to the point that the board at the time directed her to get Darvin, who would have been her second, to take over and that she was not to send out any emails, answer phone calls, or do text messages. She needed a break. And of course, the Bobcat fire came. Um, Dr. Tarosian has not had a proper day off in a year. This is a person who has worked tirelessly for our district. And I think it's important that people understand exactly how hard she's worked. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Very well said. And we echo the sentiments. Thank you, Dr. Tarosian. You have been a great leader during very difficult times. So we need to work out a day off here soon. Right? <laughs> I'll be taking a lot of time off soon. No worries. <laughs> oh, that is true. That is true. But still. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone for their patience as we had to go through this vetting process for our elementary schools. With this plan, we believe more students and families who are struggling for a variety of reasons with distance learning are able to take advantage of the high flex plan. We also recognize their children. there are children who are doing well and even thriving in distance learning or simply not ready to return. And for that reason, they will have the option to continue in distance learning, learning and that is okay. For our elementary school teachers, we know and understand and we see you. This is yet another challenge in a year of challenges. We know there are going to be a few days of really excited little ones, anxious parents and new routines but I know you will overcome these challenges and settle into new routines. Parents, we know this is yet another change, but hopefully you see this as taking a step closer to normalcy. We ask that you support your child's teacher and show them grace as they embark on a different way of teaching. Please practice the protocols with your children and explain how important they are. Those conversations need to happen ahead of time and every day until they return. To our students, we can't wait to see your beautiful faces again. We can't wait to drive by our schools and see the children playing in the yards again. This will put a smile on all of our faces as well as everyone throughout our beautiful community of Monrovia. The schools have been lonely without you. See you all soon. And with that, I will adjourn this meeting, special board meeting at 2.16 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Take care.